All right. So in talking about um, a design principle such as rhythm, um, it might seem kind of overly simplistic. However, it's actually really quite um, engaging. So we generally associate rhythm, obviously, with things that are audible. Um, it's based on the notion of repetition. And there are some things that get confused with it, so make sure you have a firm understanding um, before you walk away from this lecture. Usually rhythm is based on the repetition of elements that are the same or only slightly different. And those elements are almost always non-objective, meaning shapes, right? Um, rhythm is a beat or a flow of images that invoke a feeling of pattern or rhythm. So it oftentimes has a physiological connection, like your body feels rhythm when you see it. Um, and it can do a lot of things. Um, so here are some rules as we move into the concept relating to rhythm and when you use it, uh, what happens? Um, abrupt changes in rhythm are generally jarring or discomforting. So if you break the rules that situate itself uh, along the lines of being aesthetically pleasing, know that you're going to have that effect on your viewer. Humans will oftentimes seek balance and find security in rhythm. It's created by repetition, pretty obvious. Repeated patterns will convey a sense of movement. Uh, I might have referred to this before in previous lectures as a, um, as a visual thrust. So rhythm in that play with movement can also affect the viewer emotionally um, and psychologically. So in order to create rhythm, you do it through three primary methods, repeating a color, a line, or a shape. And there are multiple types of rhythm. We'll talk primarily about three, but there are more than that in the end. Um, there are regular repetition, alternating rhythm, and progressive rhythm, okay? So regular repetition is the easiest to identify. Um, it's generally the, 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 the most precise and it's generally something you'll see a lot in minimalist art. So the example I have here is Donald Judd. Um, you can go to the Storm King Art Center and see a lot of minimalist uh, art and you'll see a lot of, 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 of rhythm used as a device in order to create a visual experience. But it also relates to uh, music. Uh, meter is that uh, very thing that we oftentimes talk about be being in conjunction and directly related to uh, musical repetition. Um, not only non-objective shapes are capable of producing an undulating rhythm. So I said usually non-objective shapes will create a rhythm, but we can see rhythm um, in, in, in things that are naturalistic as well, such as these trees here. Um, so I've got a little quote there, a rhythmic pattern can establish an emotional response in a viewer. That's very obvious. So like the rhythmic pattern of these trees ultimately creates this sort of parallel between uh, the tree itself and the human body and the imperfection of the human body. They sort of look like leaning figures. So the psychological response will relate to the psychology of our bodies and the world around us. So we're going to ultimately see this as a kind of social group, right? Um, and that moodiness can translate over into uh, motion as well. So we oftentimes talk about this repeating shape and arrangement, um, but we can also talk about rhythm in terms of colors and textures, right? So in, in music, we call it legato, um, and that refers to the connecting and flowing um, directionality of an artwork, okay? So you can use the term legato in uh, visual art as well, such as the one that you see here. Ultimately, what you're seeing is this sort of lead into this image that sort of pendulates back and forth in this kind of repeating motion, but it's not a regular motion. We'll also see this in architecture. Um, you'll see a lot of uh, rhythmic patterns utilized as a means to show you how to move through a space. And showing you how to move through a space is ultimately the um, end goal of what an architect does. It teaches you how to move through the space, but ultimately how to lead the life that you lead within that space. Um, it's super common with especially things like Greek temples. Okay, So here we're seeing repetition created with this use of the stairway, and then the stairway repeated, and then the stairway over here. So these lines that just sort of move our eye throughout the space tell us where to lead our body as well. 
Um, the next kind of type of rhythm is alternating rhythm. Um, and that's when uh, ultimately we see different elements of an artwork repeat themselves in a predictable order. So it's an irregularity of shapes, but a regularity in order. Does that make sense? Um, such as what you see here in this little illustration, okay? Um, the next type is called alternating rhythm. And alternating rhythm um, ultimately just plays with pattern, right? Um, you'll see it a lot in nature. Um, you'll see it in terms of, I think it, as a metaphor, the best way to think about this is tides, right? The tides are regular um, in the time that they come, in either being high or low tide. However, um, it is irregular in that um, it, it, it alternates throughout the day. So alternating rhythm is a successive pattern in which the same elements reappear, reappear in a regular order, okay? So think of it like the tides. Um, vibrating colors can be used to do that in order to create an alternating rhythm. So it's colors that create a disturbance in the retina, creating a visual vibration for the viewer. So these two colors here, if uh, you listen carefully during our color theory lecture, what they are is high intensity colors, very close to the same value. And as we learned, when you take two high intensity colors that are really close to the same value, they appear to undulate or they appear to move even though they do not. Um, staccato, another musical term that we'll use, um, has an, it has abrupt changes with dynamic contrast. So even though nothing about this Piet Mondrian painting is actually a perfect pattern, it creates a kind of rhythm because our eye moves from one shape to the next as we move throughout these linear forms, which create the direction for our eye to move. Um, but ultimately, staccato is also related to, um, uh, what, what is the word? Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. It is, hold on, it's coming. I can't remember it. Um, I'll remember it throughout the later, later part of the, the lecture. Um, but what staccato does is that abrupt change tells us to pause, right? Much in the same way that a musical note tells us to pause. And what I mean by telling us to pause is I mean telling your eye to pause. Um, I'm still trying to think of that word. <laughs> All right, we'll move on. Uh, another type of rhythm is called progressive rhythm. Um, it ultimately is the rhythm of a piece seems to increase or progress. So it seems to either grow larger or grow smaller or move back into space or go forward into space. Minor variations can absolutely add interest to a composition. Highly suggest that you do that if you wanna create visual interest. Um, whereas regular rhythm and alternating rhythm suggest repetition, movement, and exaggeration, progressive rhythm seems to suggest change, whimsy, and defeat of expectations. It can be surprising. So let's, let's dive into that. Regular rhythm and alternating rhythm suggest repetition, movement, exaggeration, but progressive rhythm, so this flaring out or flaring in or moving back or moving forward suggests whimsy or delights your viewer because it defeats your expectations, right? It's a surprise. So know that. Um, Progressive rhythm uh, can relate to what we call converging patterns. And we really do see this in nature, which is why I have the um, Edward Weston photograph of the artichoke hat, right? So what is progressive rhythm? Um, just like we've talked about, it's another type of rhythm, whereas repetition of a shape changes in a regular manner. Um, we can do that through the convergence of pattern though. So a series of shapes that gets bigger or smaller, um, creates this sort of progressive rhythm. So you can use colors to do this, values to do this, textures to do this, but more importantly, shapes are used to do this, such as in this illustration. Um, it's a specially familiar type of rhythm that we use in the United States for, for, you know, for us. Um, perspective is an example of progressive rhythm as everything gets smaller as it moves towards the vanishing point. 
So you'll see rhythm pretty much in any photograph of architecture that you take or any drawing that incorporates a uh, linear technical perspective. Rhythmic sensations engage the senses. Um, and, and I mean a variety of senses, not just just your vision. What we have here is a $5 word called kinesthetic empathy. Kinesthetic as a term, you should probably remember. It means you learn through the motion of your body or you learn by doing something essentially. Um, kinetic is a term that's very closely related to kinesthetic, but kinetic means to do, right? To move. So kinesthetic empathy, it's when a visual experience in an art piece stimulates one or more of our senses. So if you look at the piece of art and you can hear music or taste the picture, that is kinesthetic art. So it relates to aesthetics. So it's movement in, in um, aesthetics. So it might evoke different senses in your body, right? So uh, kinesthesia is a psychological condition that is known uh, to affect a few individuals. People, people do experience this. Some, I, I experience it when I see one particular painting. Um, it, an example of a, um, kinesthesia is when you have a person looking at a painting and they hear a sound or they smell something. So in evoking sight, sound, and touch, um, rhythm of an artwork can create a kind of sensation. So for an, an example, uh, heat or a metallic sound. You might feel heat when you look at uh, the color red, for example. Suprematism is another um, term you probably haven't heard of. It was uh, an experimental art form uh, invented in the early 1900s in Russia. Um, that really did sort of dive into the stylistic elements of the industrialist era, such as this Casimir Melevich um, drawing, um, which really is minimalist. It uses repetition. It's ultimately very withholding. Uh, Tara Donovan, uh, sorry, uh, you can't really see that. I'll move that down a little bit. Uh, Tara Donovan is an artist who is very popular today, and she is a MacArthur Genius a, a Grant Award winner. And she is the type of artist who collects um, things that are kind of just in your everyday. Um, so here we have clear drinking cups, ones that you might drink out of at an art opening, perhaps. And she's arranged them in such a way to create this installation slash sculpture. And she's arranged it very carefully in order to create an undulating pattern. An undulating pattern that obviously reminds us of the ocean or a heartbeat. Um, it ultimately is meant to create this sort of transformative experience that also transforms something that you really do overlook in your daily experience. Most of you wouldn't think about making a sculpture out of a drinking cup, but you'll note that it's half a million drinking cups. It's a very specific number. So conceptually, what this may relate to is, is if what we're doing here is we're trying to evoke, she is, the kind of understanding that this visual experience is meant to suggest waves in an ocean, what plagues us today as 21st century consumers more than, um, more than climate change? And of course, the health and well-being of the oceans as it gets polluted with one-time use only plastics, right? So we have a lot going on here that she's really unpacking, which is why she got the MacArthur Genius Award. She's brilliant. Another one, uh, another interesting piece of hers is this one million index cards and glue. So she's not in any way transformed her, um, her material, um, but what she has done is she's transformed them in the way that she's assembled them together yet again. And these are sort of evocative. Uh, here, wake up. What, what do these shapes remind you of? Where do you see these shapes in your world or have you ever seen them on the internet? What do they remind you of? Wakey, wakey, eggs and bakey. Uh, icebergs. Mm -hmm. What else? Um, it kind of reminds me of like cliffs. I don't know. That might be wrong, but like what cliffs? C Close? Cliffs. Cliffs. Yeah. I, I think, yes. Um, she's making earth formations, essentially. She did that in the last image as well. 
But I think what she's really trying to touch on here is stal like stalactites or stalagmites. I, I never can remember which one's which. The ones that come from the ground in a cave, right? Or cliffs, uh, the landscape in general, right? Um, and I really do think that she's using these things that we, we consume in high numbers as a means to make commentaries about the way nature is ordered, the way nature is abused, and the way nature ultimately is this resource that we exploit in order to just live our lives. Um, so I really, I think she's a brilliant artist worth, your, worth, worth being on your uh, radar. All right. So just to review, as we think about making strong visual compositions, as we move a little bit further into our discussion about rhythm, the best ways to create a focal point in your work are you, these three things. By either creating a dominating factor, so it's the largest contrasting or dramatic element in the composition, you can use a subdominant factor, which are the secondary elements that complement the dominant in character, okay? So uh, you're using subdominant things in order to point to a dominant thing. Or you can create a subordinate factor. And this is, this is oftentimes uh, a little more clever. Uh, and you, have, you really have to rely on your, uh, your, um, your knowledge base in order to pull this out. But it's designed to fill in what is missing. So like an example of that would be negative shape. So the subordinate should contrast, but be sensitive to the dominant and the subdominant. So all of these things can create a focal point. You don't just have to have one dark thing. You can use all of these things together as a means to create an interesting focal point. So an example of a subdominant, so secondary elements that complement the dominant in character. As we look at this image here, this sculpture, what is the dominant element according to what's circled? So we have the ceramic sculpture, right? What's the dominant element here in this, in this shape? The hand, I believe. No. The, oh, sorry. Look at the hole. What is it? Color. Nope. Just tell me what it is. Like, are, those cup, are they cupcakes? No, they are cupcakes, but that's not the dominant. It's a vessel, right? It's a vase. So we've got that light blue circle around the vase there. That's the dominant. Okay. Now, now I'll ask the question and you won't be wrong. What's the subdominant? The hands and the Good. cupcakes. The hands. It's the hands because the hands ultimately are a repeating pattern. Boom, 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 boom of like elements. And they're probably the second largest. They're in close proximity to each other. And then what is the subordinate focal point of this image? Which leaves us one thing. These, I don't know, cherries? What are they? Cherries? Che I think they're cherries with their stems tied. That's the best thing I can come up with there. Uh, I think they're cupcakes with cherries with the stem to, stems up top. And so we have the dominant element, we have the subdominant element, and then we have the subordinate element, okay? And all of these things work together in order to create this sort of visually impactful experience. Three things. Now, it just so happens that there are three things in this image, right? The vessel, the hands, and the cherry, but really, the, the cupcakes are not a dominant factor in terms of focal point. Um, oh, and what does that? Color and shape. The irregularity of the shape of the fingers, the color of the, um, the cherries, and then, of course, the big dominant shape that actually defines the context for why these things actually exist. Make sense? Um, so repetition is used heavily in contemporary art because most contemporary art really does sort of fall into a more minimalist aesthetic, although I'm a maximalist uh, and lots of people are counter to that. Um, but Jessica Stockholder is one of them. She creates these um, sculptural installation experiences that oftentimes use um, light and electricity. And you're meant to move through them, but they act both as obstructions, but also patterns in order to invade your visual experience. And this one you can see in LA. Um, 
actually this one's at Miami Basel, but there's one at LACMA, which is at the LA County Art Museum, um, right when I walk in. So the big question, what in the world is the difference between rhythm and movement? So rhythm is a regular spacing of visual elements, lines, shapes, colors, etc., just like the beat of a, a piece of music. Doom, 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 right? It does not have to be continuous though. So as long as it repeats, so one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, one, two is a rhythmic pattern just as much as one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, okay? Rhythm. But movement is the path that your eye takes throughout a work of art. So rhythm helps us accomplish, accomplish this. So rhythm is together with movement, but they are two different things. Movement can be created with just a line without relying on rhythm. But when you use rhythm and movement together, you can have a very interesting image. So Warhol, specifically in this image that you've all seen a million times probably of Marilyn Monroe, he has a strong sense of rhythm and pattern, but no clear movement, okay? Uh, Kandinsky uh, is ultimately using strong directional movement with this hard line that diagonally uh, bisects this image but there is absolutely no discernible rhythm or pattern in it, okay? But this image culminates to use all, uh, all of those elements. So there's a strong movement created by the use of space through proximity and arrangement, the proximity of these little triangles together, and then how close they are together in order to create this visual shape. And it's the repeating shape itself and diminishing in size, okay? So the eye is drawn in a swoop and we move back into space although the arrangement of the triangles is too very chaotic to be considered a pattern or rhythm, okay? So write down these five things. You don't have to write down the directions but, or the um, definitions, but we'll go over them very quickly. There are five different types of rhythm that I'm gonna ask you to identify right after this slide. There's regular rhythm, which is describing an artwork that contains repeated elements with specific order or arrangement that can be measured. So it can be measured. So some regular rhythm examples include evenly spaced windows or tiles, all right? Regular rhythm. Then we have alternating rhythm. Alternating rhythm describes an artwork that contains a repetition of two or more components that are used interchangeably, like this up here, okay? Some alternating rhythm examples include alternating light and dark colors or placing various shapes or colors in a repeating pattern. Now. What's an alternating rhythm example? The tides, when they come and go, they, you, they can be regularly expected, however they come at different times of the day, okay? Then we have random rhythm. Random rhythm describes an artwork that contains repeated elements without a specific order or arrangement. Some random, random rhythm examples include splatters of paint or shells on a beach, okay? Then we have flowing rhythm. That generally is an artwork that contains some kind of curved or circular elements that give the art movement itself. So an example might be something you would see in a flower, clouds, waves. All right, then we have your last form of rhythm, which is called progressive rhythm. It's a, just an artwork that contains repeating elements in a pattern that change either in size or color as they repeat. So progressive rhythm repeats elements in a pattern that change in size or color as they repeat. Um, does that everybody have those? Any questions about those before we move forward? Okay, everybody wrote those down because I'm gonna test you. All right, this Hokusai wave, which we hopefully know very well from our early assignment, what is this an example of? What form of rhythm is this an example of? You tell me, I'm not going to tell you at all. Flowing. Good, why? Flowing rhythm. Good, why? Because of the movement of the waves. Which is? The middle of the ocean. Which is? Circular. Good. Good. Circular and curved. What kind of example of rhythm is in this one? What do you think? Is it regular? Is it irregular? What is it? Random. 
random? It's pretty random. They're, sim they're similar elements, right? And they're similar elements in shape because of how each curve is dealt with. They're very similar, right? But it's a random pattern of like kind of related shapes, right? Good. What's this one? Reg uh, regular rhythm. Why? Because the blue uh, box repeat underneath each other. And what about those boxes? They're like in order, specific order. They're in specific order and they're all the same, right? So absolutely regular. Good. Spot on. This Andy World's Goldsworthy photograph. What do you think? It's an example of... Huh? I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, progressive, progressive rhythm, maybe? What's your definition of progressive rhythm? Remind me. Changes. Yeah. And do you see that here? Yeah. Now, even though they're not exactly the same, progressively, they tell us that they're the same, even though, because they're like objects. And because they're like objects in our psychology, they're also like objects in terms of their color and their shape orientation. They appear to progressively, um, rhythmically, diminute and grow smaller. Andy Goldsworthy is an artist that y'all should look at. He is a kind of interventionalist or interventionist uh, artist where he goes out into nature and he does different things with what he finds in order to create these really beautiful, very temporary interventions that he photographs. And the only thing left behind in his work is the photograph itself. Um, he, he's a really interesting artist. There's a movie called Rhythm and Tides that I think you all should watch this week. Um, that if you really want to zen out and feel better about nature, definitely watch it. What is this an example of? What kind of rhythm? What do you think? Um, is it... Is it alternating rhythm? Tell me why you think that? Um, because there's like two or more components that repeat. Excellent. Good. Very good. Cheers. All right. A few more. What's this an example of? Regular rhythm, alternating rhythm, random rhythm, flowing rhythm, progressive rhythm. What do you think? Is it pretty random? Does it flow? I mean, it looks like it has the same shape repeating. I don't think it looks random. Yeah, it sure does. Uh, is it an alternating rhythm? So alternating rhythm. It describes an artwork that contains a repetition of two or more shapes that are used interchangeably. What do you think? Alternating? Does that sound pretty accurate? Yeah. Yeah. They're all like shapes. All right. This one would probably be very closely related to that, though, right? Even though they're not, it's not a cubist image, right? So probably the same thing. All right. What's this one? Last one. We've got regular rhythm, alternating rhythm, random rhythm, flowing rhythm, and progressive rhythm. It looks like alternating again. I agree. I yeah. Why? Why is it alternating? Changing um, color. Yeah, the color. Yep. And also the directionality of the shapes themselves. So we have two things that make this alternating. Very good. 
Okay. 